We are back on Morning Line talking about the universe. The latest images coming back from the James Webb Space Telescope. Fascinating stuff. Billy Teets is with us, director of the Dyer Observatory here in Middle Tennessee. Really glad to have him on to share some images and talk about this. Hey, Billy, we're going to see more of these pictures here in just in a moment, the photos. Um, explain, mm -hmm. if you could, uh, the way I understand it is this is not actually... I guess when the web takes an image, okay, that they send back, it sends back to the, the earth, it's not like a color photo like I've just taken on my cell phone and there's my picture. Is it a series of numbers that are then calculated? I think a lot of people think, oh, that picture you showed us, or throw one up for us. How do you account for the color, the, the shape and everything else? Because the way I understand it, you're not actually getting a photograph back. You're getting a bunch of data that is then processed when it arrives back at Earth and you're putting together the image. Now, correct me if I'm wrong on that. No, I mean, that, that's essentially what is happening. All of the, the images come back as essentially ones and zeros, and then that's reconstructed into various images that are uh, then combined. And, and in reality, that's really what's happening in, say, your, your smartphone camera. Um, so let me give you um, a, a little sample here. Let me yeah. pull up a, an image. And this one is not as well known. This was released just a few days ago. Uh, wow. Switch over here. So this is a really fun view of Jupiter. Yeah. Um, so what we're seeing here is, uh, you know, it's, it's a false color view of Jupiter because remember, this is being taken in the infrared. So okay. this is light emitted by Jupiter that our eyes can't see, but uh, we're, we're color coding it into a way we, we can see it. Um, so Jupiter is, you know, nice uh, kind of a purple view here. Um, but you'll notice in the background, like this bright object with the um, sure. uh, the star or the six points on it, though, that is uh, it's one or one of its large moons called Europa. It's a little bit smaller than our own moon. This image is actually a combination of three different uh, images uh, that all started out as black and white. Uh, but as Webb is taking these images, um, the, the different images are being taken through different filters. So uh, one image will be taken through uh, a filter that only lets through a, a certain wavelength or a certain color of infrared light. Um, then another image is taken through another filter that lets through a, a different color. So it's essentially like, you know, an analogy would be if we were to take an image uh, through a red filter and then an image through a green filter and then one through a blue filter, we color combine those or we low overlay those three images and that gives us our nice color image. Um, your your phone is essentially doing the same thing. The, the sensor in your phone can really only detect light. It can't detect if it's red or green or blue, but in front of each of those pixels are different colored filters. Okay. And um, it's essentially taking kind of three images at one and combining to give us those those nice color images. Wow. But here what you're seeing, yeah. uh, three different images of Jupiter were taken and each one of those was assigned a specific color. Um, and you can have some artistic license here as, uh, uh, as we see here in this picture. Um, but the background image that contained Europa, that, that bright object on the left, that was only taken through one, uh, in one image through one filter. And so that's why it looks black and white right now. Um, so those three different images of Jupiter were also black and white, but then uh, the processing team said, okay, we're gonna make this one color uh, or this one image, you know, um, a, a blue, this other image a red and this other image a, a, a green. Um, and, and in this case, I okay. think they left out the green, hey, but they, yeah. they color combined those. Gotcha, and Billy, so I know there've been a lot of images taken of Jupiter that we've seen in the past. Now, as you look at this one, since you happen to throw this up and maybe it's still being determined, do you have any sense of what an image like this is telling us? Is there anything new that we're able to learn from seeing this from Webb as opposed to some of the other images we've seen in the past? Uh, any observations at this point? Uh, yeah, in fact, let me do a, a, just a quick comparison. I'll, I'll put up an image from Hubble that was taken about, let's see if I can find it here, mm -hmm. uh, about two years ago. Okay. There's one from Jupiter. This is more of uh, what our eyes would see if we could, if we look at Jupiter through a telescope, which got one, uh, get up early morning, you'll see Jupiter blazing away, but this is taken in visible light. So Jupiter has that really famous great red spot right there, which is a giant storm that's lasted for hundreds of years. We can see the different bands of, of cloud layers here 
which you see have different colors. Some are white, some are kind of a rusty color. But now we compare that uh, back over to the, the image from web. Let me s scroll back over there to get it. Yep. And there we have um, the, uh, kind of the same view there. Um, the brighter the, 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 uh, the feature in here, like um, this, uh, the bright spot here, yeah. that is the green spot. So we're, when the, the, um, the part of the view that, or the part of the, the image that's brighter means that there's more infrared light coming out. So for infrared, if you're seeing brighter colors, that means you're seeing more of the heat coming out. So we're actually seeing in these different cloud layers, we're seeing deeper into the planet in some of the brighter layers. And in some of the darker layers, we're seeing more of the, the cooler cloud tops there. Um, now, one thing that was really um, kind of made everybody's jaw drop was that even with the best Hubble images, you're not going to be able to see Jupiter's ring system, which is very, very faint. Hmm. In fact, we didn't know Jupiter had rings until Voyager 1 passed by it in the early 70s and went into the shadow of Jupiter, and we saw the, the rings kind of lit up. From the back but if you carefully look at this image in fact let me go to a label view there yeah. you can see a very faint ring system encircling the planet and you'll also notice yeah. that this little spot here uh -huh. metis which is one of uh, many moons of jupiter is one of the closer in moons you see it coincides perfectly with that ring um, so that is direct observational evidence to support that uh, the rings of jupiter are being created by uh, essentially micro or little meteorites hitting this moon, blasting material off that moon, and it's going into orbit around Jupiter to form a ring because that moon is orbiting within that ring there. Okay. And there's a couple of other things that uh, kind of surprised uh, folks, and it was, uh, for example, um, along the right edge of Jupiter here, it looks like there's a, a thin, thin layer of atmosphere that's kind of separated. I had never really seen that before. So uh, this, this is you know just one of the very first views of Jupiter. So there's gonna be more research done to try to figure out what exactly is causing that. So it's gonna give us some insights into how the atmosphere of Jupiter is working and you know how the atmospheres of other gas giant planets is working. So Webb, as you've said, has given us, um, I guess, a window into some of these galaxies far away, but it's also gonna be used to maybe really observe some of these planets closer to us. Is it going to be able to get a, a uh, maybe a real good up close look at Mars. Um, I mean, some of the other planets as well. Yes. Yeah, so um, I remember seeing that one of the the primary solar system targets for uh, for Webb is going to be Mars, um, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, uh, asteroids as well. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't put it in my my slides here, but uh, one of the tests for Webb was to see how accurately it could track objects that are moving. So all these these planets are moving through our solar system, but they move, you know, relatively slow on the sky. But asteroids can move much quicker on the sky typically because they're closer to us uh, but Webb was shown that it could very successfully track an asteroid so it's going to be studying asteroids as well uh, learn about the composition of those asteroids uh, really the only thing that Webb is not going to be able to observe um, is the the earth and the moon um, uh, okay. Venus because it's closer to the Sun in fact the Hubble Space Telescope is not permitted to look at Venus because that's getting it uh, looking pretty close to the sun there. And, and that's, you know, if, if if one of these telescopes accidentally pointed at the sun, it would destroy the the, the cameras in there. Uh -huh. um, and we won't be able to see Mercury as well. But the other planets will be able to uh, check out um, the objects outside of the orbit of Pluto, uh, like Kuwar and uh, Hamehameha, uh, which are kind of like the, they're called transit Neptunian objects. They're like other Plutos that are out there. They'll also be studied, um, and you know we'll get a lot more information about those guys. Is uh, I'm curious so how, there, how, how the, yeah how out. how the telescopes actually being operated is uh, is Webb basically is there a control base where there is someone who is actually at the controls where you're manipulating Amy able to send signals to Webb to direct it to a certain direction and or is it and, and is it constantly sending back images or is this an image that's taken where someone here on Earth is activating it to take that shot and send it back. Uh, how much interaction is there? Or is it pretty much autonomous just sending things back and going on its own pace? 
So uh, there is a ground team that sends all the commands. Uh, so it's controlled out of the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is uh, just outside of Greenbelt, Maryland. Uh, they're also the group that controls Hubble. But um, it, it's not like somebody sitting at a computer, like, you know, with a joystick yeah. telling the <laughs> telescope where how to move there. So there's a, a preset program uh, that is uploaded to the telescope to say, OK, here's uh, what you're going to look at. Here are the coordinates. Uh, here are the cameras that you're going to use. Here are the filters that are going to be used. So all of that data is, is uploaded to the telescope, and then the telescope itself will then um, all the, the the onboard computer will uh, talk with various systems to move the telescope uh, to the object that it's looking at or going to be looking at. And then once it's at that object, there are. Uh, uh, essentially little telescopes on the, on the web called star trackers, which uh, focus on a star and they keep their eye on that star and make sure that uh, it looks like it's staying perfectly still. Or in other words, the, mm -hmm. um, the, the web is per, uh, perfectly you know, pointed. So um, all of that, uh, the, the, the cameras then take the images, that data is stored. Uh, if I remember correctly, um, web, uh, it, there, there's not a, a constant stream of data from it. Um, there, are, um, there are preset times in which the, the data are downloaded. Um, I, I think it's, um, I want to say it's, you know, a few hours each day. Um, and then other commands are sent up, and then you wait for that next period to come through. So there is uh, uh, there are three ground stations on the planet called the deep, NASA's Deep Space Network, and they're used to communicate with Webb, with other missions like Gaia, with even with the Voyager probes that were launched back, you know, uh, close to 50 years ago. Um, so uh, they've all those ground stations have other things they have to communicate with as well. So. Um, you know, web gets its turn every now and then. We're going to take a break. We'll come back. Our final segment uh, with Billy Teets, director of the Dyer Observatory. If he has some more images, we'll take a look at those as we're talking about uh, the latest from the James Webb Space Telescope, an exciting time for space exploration. Back with more right after this.